inevitable robot overlords. Hey, I'm, I'll embrace the singularity. I'll embrace it. I, for one, welcome our robot overlords. <laughs> I think uh, we're there. Hello. Uh, are we on air? Are we okay? The future. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> robots of the future. Thank you very much for making us your pets. Um, my name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for uh, Sunday, October the 6th, 2013. Uh, so we've got a good night tonight. This is great. We've got a ton of telescopes. We've got a ton of, uh, of mind power going to be joining us tonight, and, uh, and we're going to show you the sky, and we're going to explain the sky, and it's going to be super fun. So if you've never done this before, this is the virtual star party is where we hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and show you what's up in the night sky right now. So let's just in, sort of, uh, I'm going to bring everyone in. So first we got, uh, we got Bill McLaughlin. Hey, Bill. That's me. Haven't seen you in a while. And you're, and you're seeing, how's your seeing tonight? Uh, I can't tell you yet. I haven't looked at the monitor, but uh, that doesn't start till eight o'clock. So, <laughs> right, a little. Uh, but you're saying it's been a little murky for the last. It's been of days. It, the seeing's been terrible, although it's really clear. Well, then let's just ride this wave until uh, until the end of the show. And then I don't really care. <laughs> um, <laughs> we got Gary Ganella. Hey, Gary. Hi, guys. Don't be afraid. He's how's your How's money. your seeing? That's uh, not bad. Got a little high clouds scattered in there, but I think I should be able to shoot between them and uh, be very afraid when Fraser is running the thing. <laughs> and Roy Salisbury, who, who, from what I can tell, is just a... Oh, no, there we go. He's, he is just a nebula tonight. He is. His camera is not working. <laughs> can you even hear us, Roy? Is your microphone working? Roy? Yes, I, now I do. <laughs> I hear right. you now. Right. Uh, yeah. Now you're you're normally you're operating out of your Las Vegas comfortable Las Vegas apartment, but now you are operating from from the actual remote uh, secret facility in the desert. Yeah. And Which uh, has very very limited internet access, so I'm stretching it out here. But you have a Stargate. That's yeah. awesome. I yeah. love that. <laughs> and and the ability to whack your telescopes with a hammer as necessary. So Oh no no no. <laughs> uh, great. And we got a new astronomer who's gonna be joining us tonight. And uh, there he is. So Scott Ferguson. And uh, where are you located, Scott? Uh, tonight I'm in Titusville, Florida. And when we did a bunch of tests, you were like by a lake in a park on a boat <laughs> ramp. Are you? Are you yeah, is that normally, where you are? No, normally I'm over on the west coast of Florida. Tonight I'm on the east coast of Florida, so tonight's an unusual departure for me. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, and how's your seeing tonight? Uh, seeing's pretty decent. We have some passing clouds, but for the most part, it's been clear. Good, good. Okay. Well, and you, it's great. Now your setup. Now people haven't seen your setup before. So what have you got as a telescope? I don't know. Can you uh, turn the the laptop and show the? the I telescope? can try. Is there any lighting? I can try. There, there's no lighting out here for this. Oh, okay. So. I should yeah, have a warning that I might ask you to do this kind of thing. I don't know if you can see it at all. I see a bunch of light. I see a telescope. We a totally light. see it. Oh yeah. yeah, there's a guide scope. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So oh, I've got cool. the uh, eight inch LX two hundred, and I've got an eighty millimeter Orion refractor on top of it. Uh, the main telescope, the Alex 200, I've got a uh, Malincam, and through the refractor, I've got an Attic Titan. Perfect. And now the Malincam is is very interesting to me. We've uh, we've had a bunch of cameras on board, uh, and yours though. So does Curiosity. Have... What's that? <laughs> Curiosity has some Malincams on board too. Do they really? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. Um, uh, yeah, and so, the, but the mountain cams are kind of an interesting kind of camera. So maybe you can explain a bit about how that works. Actually, you know, before we get to, before we get to that, I just want to go one second. I, I forgot. We've got David Dickinson. I've hey, hey. I just went I can, just about went down that rabbit hole. So hold on, I, let me let me I, finish. I can, I can show you my idle telescope. I think it will show there in the oh. living room. There it is. <laughs> Also in Florida, but there's no targets for you tonight, so you're... No, there's no planetary or moon targets, and it probably won't be till early. Well, actually, we'll have the moon next week. I might be able to bring the moon into the star party. I think it will still be up at this time, since we're going earlier now. Will it be that nice moon or that stupid moon? It's going to be uh, around first quarter. Okay, that's Just a nice moon. Quarter, quarter, so. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's the best time to look at it. Uh, my co-host, partner in crime, Scott Lewis. Hey, Scott. How's it going, everyone? And Dr. Thad Zabo. Good evening, Doctor Zabo. Uh, so this is great. We got boy, we got we got four telescopes. We've got three t 
towering intellects. Uh, we got me. So this should go well. Our stunted intellect and our stunted me towering. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm going to go back to Scott for a second because, A, I love this image of the Ring Nebula. And, uh, and then, but, the, but the Malincam is kind of a weird gadget. So can you give us a bit of an explanation of how this thing works? Sure, sure. I, I'll, I'll recount what I know off the top of my head. It's, it's basically a modified video camera uh, that's been custom manufactured for the purpose, the sole purpose of operating in astronomy. So it's got thermoelectric cooling, just like you would find in a more expensive, uh, perf, you know, dedicated astronomy CCD. And it's got uh, a system called hypercircuitry, which allows you to collect light for up to 60 seconds instead of a normal 160th or 130th second of, of exposure on a video camera. So it will collect light up to 60 seconds and uh, increase the gain of that signal quite a bit in in-camera in processing and put that out as S-video. Uh, so I've got a analog to digital converter on the laptop that converts that to the digital signal you see and uh, allows me to display the image at, as if it were a webcam. Right, so it's so unlike the C, the CCDs that uh, I know that Gary and uh, and Roy are using, it's a video camera. Yes, and it's like running video for, and, but then averaging out the the view that it's seeing. And uh, yeah, they're they're pretty neat cameras. Yeah, the other thing with the Mellon cam is they operate a lot more closely to how the human eye does, and that your your typical CCD camera, your your usual astronomical cameras. The, you you have these essentially buckets for catching light, and as you fill them up, the brighter that particular pixel looks to you. But the Malincam has some circuitry that adjusts things to more of a logarithmic scale, meaning that, okay, well, if this has five times as much light as that, we display it this way, and if it has five times more, we display it this way, which is a lot more similar to how the eye works. And so you can get a far greater range of... of uh, of levels of light, for for instance, you know, you can see not only the trapezium, the very bright stars in Orion's nebula, if it's up, but you can also see the faint tendrils at the end, having this this system that uh, processes images this way, as opposed to let's fill up buckets with light. So I like buckets of light. No, it's quite <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just fill them in places. There we go. But just not into the sky. Yeah. And cause light pollution. Yeah, we need to bail out with buckets of light. <laughs> there we go. And just get rid of them. <laughs> uh, okay. That's awesome. No, that's that's a that's a great picture, Scott. And you can really see that uh, that nebulosity even in the middle of the ring nebula. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And if and when the, when the tracking is steady, you can just make out the central uh, star there in the in the middle of the nebula. Now, have you um have you set HD on your uh on your broadcast? Uh, that's a good point. Let me check yeah. that. It so should. Yeah, it's, it's bandwidth yeah, it's, usage. Yeah, it's at it's at full bandwidth usage, so okay, it should be perfect. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna move to Bill's view now. So, uh, oh, that's great. That's uh, Garden Variety M27 there. Yeah. Oh, go, wow. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. If you don't have a, a beast of a machine out there. Actually, that's just uh, uh, I've I've got the Canon 5D Mark III, not even an Astro uh, DSLR, and uh, and a, a F7 uh, Stellar View Raptor uh, 105. You have a Raptor. Is, uh, yeah, like a Velociraptor. A Velociraptor. Oh, well. <laughs> no. Yeah, and that's what they call their carbon fiber, uh, uh, 100, 105 millimeter uh, f7. It always uh, amazes yeah. me the images that we consider standard nowadays. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah when I started this, <laughs> that, that would have been that like been a, man, you yeah. know. Yeah, I, I, I unbelievably. Not. I could not imagine trying to do this with film. I mean, I, yeah. I know the difficulty that I have just with CCD imaging, let alone you can't see what you're shooting until you go to develop it however many days or weeks later. Um, the, the start in astrophotography is, is just really, uh, yeah, really just, just unbelievable, and, and the progress we've made to where we can actually do this tonight. Yeah. The fact that you can you know, grab an image and then post it online and have it right here, something that was shot within the last, like, two minutes or so. And, and have it available for people to see. Con Thanks, Moore's Law. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Google. Um, no. That's but, no, it's phenomenal what we are able to do. And just, you know, yeah, you don't like the shot? Eh, get rid of it. It's not like you had to yeah, sit we, there and develop we, it and get it exactly what, the way you needed it to, make that, sure all your light levels are correct. You astrophotographers just, routinely delete things now that are like would have been awesome ten years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like yeah, the, the stars are a little out of focus. Or... <laughs> oh, okay. Oh well. Yeah. All right, Such I'm a charmed move... life we, we're living now. <laughs> I'm moving over to Gary's view. Oh, look at that. This is M17, the Swan. 
Or isn't it? For, we've got other names. Is seventeen? It the, the lobster, the mega, the lobster, yeah, we, the yeah. horseshoe, the you know whatever paradelia you can come up with for it. There, you know, there we go. <laughs> a little bit of a zoom in on it. Very cool. Oh, that's great. But I think that's the that's the situation, right? You can see that that the very core of the uh, of the nebula here is just so bright. That's the thing. And when it was first named, I mean, it was just the part that really stands out very bright white there. And so people were like, oh, it looks kind of like a swan drifting along through the, the sky. They couldn't see all that wispiness right. that we now yeah. see around in this, this image that can just, you know, really kind of flushes it out. Um, you know, that place where it's really bright, I mean, it's, it's hydrogen gas and there's enough nearby hot bright stars really lighting that up brilliantly, but then you get these kind of faint tendrils w that are kind of just winding away from it, um, and you know, you would have you would have needed a telescope about a meter in size and a Schmidt camera on it and, and whatever, <laughs> and a, you know, Schmidt optics to be able to pull that out before. Now, you know, Gary can shoot that, I've shot that, you know, there's just about everybody who has any kind of deep sky um, experience as part of the VSP here has probably shot that in a, an image very, very similar to, to that, that uh, Again, wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. So yeah, visually through a telescope, you wouldn't see that amount of detail. Right. Um, uh, BTL 743, uh, our good friend. BTL Brian. 7, yeah. BTL 743 uh, says, "Did Thad show his image of Comet Ison? It's magical, Thad." <laughs> you have oh, magical. I've perhaps seen it on Google Plus. Yeah. I'll go get, yeah, I can go get it. So, yeah. Okay. Sure. At some point. Yeah. Uh -huh. So while we're, while we're waiting for that, too, we should do a little station identification, too, and people that want to comment and where to comment and all the fun stuff. So YouTube, just like Brian just did on BTO, um, YouTube's the safest place to find us right now since the comment tracker within the Hangouts are kind of wonky. Uh, I am over on Facebook and Twitter and through the various shares of Google+. Plus and in the event page, but if you want to get a hold of us, the best way to do it is over on YouTube. Yeah. Um... And the yeah, you can do it on the event page on Google Plus. I'm watching that, but it's yeah. sort of uh, tough. Liz Crane wants to know when she'll be able to do astrophotography with her cell phone. You, you can, can do it do right it. now. We're doing it. Yeah. Some people are doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can right. get it. You can actually buy a mount that you can put the like your your iPhone in, and then clamp it right onto your telescope right over the eyepiece, and you can take pictures that way. I have a friend in Arizona that's caught uh, transits of the International Space Station in front of the moon and the sun with his iPhone hooked up to his telescope. Wow. He's got an adapter hooked up to it. And he that's, gets pretty decent images. That's really cool. Okay, I'm going to move to Roy's view. Roy, what do we got? Oh, he, he, fortunately, he put the number up there. NGC 896. NGC 896. That is, it's a, it's the bottom knot on the uh, the heart, heart nebula. nebula. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. And and what are you shooting this from? This is all. Is this luminance that you're shooting in, or is this an H alpha? That's hydrogen alpha. That's a three minute hydrogen alpha. Okay. Um, so again, with hydrogen alpha, I mean, you're, you're able to get that one particular wavelength that comes through from hydrogen gas that is essentially fluorescing. It gets hit with a whole bunch of energy from a, a nearby star, um, and as the electrons fall from high energy levels to low energy levels, this one particular transition shows up as red light to our eye. Now, we won't see it as, as red if you're trying to look at a nebula through a telescope, um, but again, you can, can put this filter on for a camera, it becomes very sensitive. Um, and uh, to just mainly the type of light that nebulae give off then makes it possible to even kind of shoot these things from places where you have light pollution. So. It's kind of cool how you can see the dark lanes through it there too. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, a, it's actually a really big region. I know you would need probably, what, four pictures to capture the whole, the whole heart nebula? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one, I actually, I just put in a focal reducer today for this because before it was just zoomed in so much. So I put a focal reducer in here to get down from 2,000 millimeter focal length down to about 1,300. If I wanted to get the whole thing in, I'd be down, need to go down to about 400. Wow. Wow. Um, oh, uh, in group, in group on uh, YouTube notes that uh, Scott is making margaritas right now. 
So <laughs> yes. Oh wait, here's no. the blender. Scott, no, I'm not. Scott Ferguson, not Scott Lewis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got we to do something about that. Ferguson? Is the fact that this two Ferguson? Ferguson? Yeah. Ferguson? Is the fact that someone else has got your name going to keep you confused? It all is. Night, it Scott? is going to drive me nuts. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. You need to do something about it. Could though. someone Ferguson? go back in time and uh, get renamed? Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to move back over to Scott Ferguson's view. Oh, you just had a something there, and now it's gone. Oh, I see something. Yeah. Scott. Ferguson. Ferguson. Ferguson? Oh, sorry about that. I had him mute and didn't realize it. There we go. <laughs> well, you, this, you will get over this, too. Yeah, this will happen. Yeah, yeah. Now, can you yeah, so, embiggen this? Uh, this is as big as it gets, unfortunately. I can't embiggen it anymore. Um, I don't think I can. Let me see if I. Yeah, you know, there's no zoom function on this now, but uh, yeah, you can see the uh, the double cluster here in GC869 and its uh, buddy. I forget the designation of the other one, but uh, yeah, I just uh, I just had it on Andromeda Galaxy a minute ago, and it went into a power line or yeah, something. Fun. So I yeah, I've decided that wasn't the best idea. So the way I've got the uh, focal reducers configured on this telescope is not optimal right now, so there's a lot of halos around the stars, yeah. but it, it kind of adds an effect to it, I guess. Well, and it's nice to see the different colors. I mean, you can see yeah. those orangey reddy stars, you can see the more whiter and the bluer stars, and it's great to see that that texture in the cluster. So yes. It's quite a wide view, then. It's quite well, wide. I think Bill's got a picture of Canis Major. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. That's my, uh, place, that, that's my that's placeholder picture image. while I'm waiting for images oh, to come up. Man. All right. <laughs> to be able to get both Rho and Chi Persei in that, that kind of field of view, you're, you're looking at about one and a half degrees to yeah, two degrees just... from top to bottom. That is yeah. a fairly wide image of the sky. You're talking four full moons, essentially, from the top to bottom in that Cause, image. Because usually with a 40 millimeter in my telescope, 40 millimeter eyepiece, I can get like just the two cores kind of right off to the side. Looks right. great in a pair of binoculars. Yes. Yeah, it's a good, yes, it's, a, it's a good star party favorite to show people. They always like that. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to move to Gary's view. Okay, we have the uh, famous eagle, M16. And let me zoom in a little bit. Getting the pillars. Here is the main Gary's section view. with the pillars. Yep. I'm seeing a bunch of artifacting. I think there's something going on with the hangout. Like this, there's like a, find it me. Yeah, no, there's like some kind of, I don't know, like little... Yeah, it totally looks like artifacts, like this weird little pixelation over top of it. Anyway, don't worry uh, about no, that. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, when I think yeah. it's rendering to HD in those moving parts. So it's trying yeah. to keep the still parts in HD while it's moving. Yeah, okay. Save bandwidth. Yeah, well, enjoy the, uh, the Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation. That's, That's awesome. it. That is awesome. Come back a little bit. And this, again, is all in hydrogen alpha. How old, Thad, would a... Uh, would an object like this be? Like, how long has this nebula been making stars? Let's see. Well, I mean, the the typical lifetime for your largest and most luminous stars is about 10 million years, and we know there are a few of them in there. So, the other the other issue here, trying to get a kind of a lifetime on this, is as more of those stars are formed, the radiation pressure from them drives the nebula away. Um, as supernovae go off in the nebula, those shock waves also start to, to tear apart the nebula. In fact, one thing um, that we're pretty sure of is that those pillars don't lo no longer exist, is that we know that the supernovae have gone off nearby and the shock waves have probably collapsed or, or blown away the, the pillars. So if, if, you're looking, if you're looking at a nebula region like this, you know, probably maybe a million to ten million years tops would be... Um, a lifetime for for this kind of region. Because and how long would it will will it last? Like if we were to keep looking in the sky, how long into the future will we still see something like this until it just looks like a like a star cluster? Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, the, the nebulosity would probably be probably be gone within the next next five to ten million years easily. I mean, the, the thing is, as as it makes new stars, um, it's using up the hydrogen that's in there, and then again, the radiation pressure from the hydrogen that's present will, will start to drive out um, the material that's there, and you just won't have an, you'll have a star cluster, but you won't have a nebula around anymore. So, so we would transition, like right now, it's very much, you know, like it's like the Orion Nebula, you know, all these big star forming regions, right? But then you would end up a situation where it's more like the what, Pleiades, like the Pleiades, Orion. yeah. Right. 
And and yeah, I mean, and then I guess I, I should be careful with with how I'm phrasing some of the timing here because there is some regeneration when stars go supernova. They do flood the area with material again after ever going supernova. So you they could have greater longevity than that as you start to recycle material from uh, earlier rounds of star formation into supernova blowing up and and putting out more material there. Um, but essentially, you know, one one cycle for Stars collapsing, star goes through its lifetime, star blows up as a supernova. For your most massive stars, that's about 10 million years. Um, and we know some of those mass most massive stars have to be present, otherwise you don't get the light needed to light up the nebula. Those That type of light only comes from O-class stars, your most massive stars are the only ones that dump out enough ultraviolet light to really jazz up those electrons in a, in, in a hydrogen cloud and get it to glow this way. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay, so so really it's only those gigantic stars, and they're all going to detonate as, as you said, as supernova, right? So it's, so ev whatever is illuminating this nebula is going to blow up. Yes, yes. Ah. Maybe even, even a B-class, if you look at the Pleiades, the Pleiades are B-class stars. Um, bright blue, you know, gorgeous to look at in a telescope, but they don't dump out enough ultraviolet light to, to really get a nebula going like this. And so it's only your most massive and, again, shortest-lived stars that can do that. I am so glad we we bring you here. <laughs> um, uh, so, and Chet1138, our good friend Chet1138, says, after the big stars blow, how long will it take smaller stars to form out of the results? So that's kind of interesting because what's going on is you don't get star formation unless something disturbs the gas. It typically won't collapse under its its own just gravity. There's any little bit of thermal emission, any turbulence will prevent stars from forming. And so you actually need that supernova to act as the initiator for the next round of star formation. So once the new once the old ones blow, it's gonna be within yeah, you know, within a within a million years that you have the next generations of stars forming from the shockwave disturbances caused by that older generation of stars. Um, oh, Scott Ferguson. Now we didn't talk about this beforehand. I know one of the things that that you're going to help us with at some point is uh, to bring in live views of the International Space Station. Yeah, I saw you had an image of it trailing there. Yeah. So, do you have any video kicking around of of you capturing the space station? I don't know on that computer. I know we didn't talk about this in advance, so I'm sort of throwing you on the spot. Yeah, throwing yeah. you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, not not on this computer. Not on uh, this computer. Oh, well, okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Next time, next time. Yep. Um, so I see a cluster. Yes, I just pulled in the M56 cluster. Uh, I just had a technical issue as well where I accidentally pulled a deck cable out a little bit, so uh, my alignment may not be perfect here at this point, but uh, just make the best of it. So I just pulled down uh, the M56 cluster, uh, globular cluster, and... Uh, uh, we don't say that around here, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Glo we it's globular. It's globular. We globular. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> globular. <laughs> right. People are mean. making fun of the way I say globular, all right? Hey, oh, it's, I it's, see. And, okay. and Michael Phillips looked it up, and it's perfectly it's acceptable. Yep. It's both ways. Just and so Fraser right. can tell us to take off, cause it take off and 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, it never gets old, does it? it? No, it doesn't. Ever. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Bill, could you uh, rotate your images? Because right now they're vertical, and so they're not. We're not seeing them in all their full glory. Can you bring the glory to this hangout? Could you? Bill? Could you? Yeah. Could you find <laughs> a little more glory, please, Bill? <laughs> there. Now we're cooking. All right. Um, I'm gonna go over to Bill's view. Look at that. Wow, that's fantastic. That's, that's awesome. Oh, <laughs> little old, little old this. That's just that's terrific. That's the veil. Yeah, that's the wow. The, uh, western part of the veil nebula. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, you just can't see it. It's beautiful. Now we we talked about stars blowing up, and that's that's what happened here. This is the leftover remnant of a star that would have detonated a few thousands to tens of thousands of years ago, and so this is just kind of one edge of it. It really takes up a huge portion of the sky where this uh, supernova remnant is, and this is just kind of, this. what you get is kind of this, this expanding bubble in space, and this is just like one wall of the bubble. So, um, sometimes think, called the pencil nebula. I think um, this may be the one that there's some Chinese records of, uh, actually, of seeing the supernova remnant there. At least there's, there's some intriguing possibilities of it. And this was one of these these cases where I don't think there's anything left. I mean, it was probably yeah. um, 
a, a white dwarf that swallowed too much of a nearby red supergiant star and reached the, the mass limit where the entire white dwarf undergoes fusion at once and blows up as a supernova. So it's called oh, type, so... type, type 1A supernova. And, I, uh, I just learned something new again. So this, so the, <laughs> the, the veil progenitor was a type 1A supernova. I don't think they've ever found a pulsar or a black hole that would be the kind, the, the thing that's left over from a type 2 supernova. Um, now, can I assume that the reason we're seeing more stars above the uh, nebula than we are below is because some of the dust and gas were swept away? I mean, you're seeing, and it, it's pretty obvious if you look through a telescope visually that on one side of the nebula there's a lot more stars visible than on the other side. I'm not sure what the, the orientation is for where you'd be looking through kind of the, the core of where the, the bulk of the explosion was and on, on which side is, is the stars. I mean, it could, uh, it doesn't look like it could be chance, but there's, you know, this is kind of on the border of the, the thick of the Milky Way through the sky. It may just be that on, on one side you're looking more toward the plane of the Milky Way and on as we have it oriented here below it, you're looking a little bit ab above Actually, in this case, below below the plane of the Milky Way, um, on the other side. So it it might be dust. The thing is, though, dust. I mean, usually usually you can see things that indicate dark nebulae. Right. And not really seeing the kind of knots or the the kind of you get kind of a Cold brownish, stash, like, yellowish, right. yeah, kind of edges to when when you can shoot dark nebulae. And you I mean, you clearly have a deep enough exposure here that if there were dark nebulae. Um, that they should be evident. It may just be kind of a chance alignment where this, this supernova kind of occurs at the boundary between the thick of the Milky Way and where um, it starts to thin out a bit in the sky. It's amazing to capture that in an image, though. That's uh, uh, you, know, you don't yeah. usually can, can see that kind of transition. Yeah, nice color in it. Uh, yeah. BTL743 asks, I have a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars. Do you suggest a monopod or a tripod? Mm. Tripod. Scott, you've got, got, you got a pair of those, don't you? If they have a mount for a tripod, a screw for Mine are 15 by 70. But yeah. yeah, 10 by 50, I mean, you know, you can almost just... Those, those are hand, usually handheld. Usually handheld yeah. to go lean on a car or something, right? I think, they, I think they make adapters for them for a tripod, but oh, right. most of them don't come with the, the screw adapters. Right. I, yeah. I, I, have, I have a pair of image-stabilized binoculars that rock. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're about the price of a, of a new telescope, though. Right. So. It's yeah, a, but, it, yeah. I mean, when when it comes to, as far as that goes, it depends on what you're trying to do. I can do some afocal imaging with my binoculars, so I do get a tripod for that. But if you're just looking to observe, you know, whatever you can do to stabilize it, it's okay. not, I can't do, I can't hold these up for a very long period of time without my hands just starting to shake. Speaking but, of binoculars, too, uh, we were talking on Twitter about I usually watch the International Space Station with binoculars, and you can see detail with a pair of 10 by 50s. It's worth yeah. checking out. Well, and that's why I wanted Scott to show off his his video of the space station because it's yeah. it's just amazing. Like if you want evidence that there are humans in space, that this space program is real, those just are the take very a few. Look. Those yeah. are the very few NASA employees that are still working right now. Right. Oh. <laughs> it is. Oh, that sucks. Uh, I'm going to move to Gary's view. Okay, M31 Andromeda. So M31, M32, and M110. So we've got That's the, the right. main nucleus. And when we say Andromeda, we're, we're not talking about the whole galaxy because the edges of this thing would extend way beyond what Gary has imaged here. It stretches about three degrees across, and the field of view here is maybe about a, a degree and a half. So we're actually kind of missing the outer edges of it. But you do get um, that bright fuzzy ball just to the right of center here. That is M32. That is a separate dwarf elliptical galaxy. And way up in the corner, he got this frame just right, mm -hmm. is M110, which is another separate dwarf elliptical AKA galaxy. AKA the Google Plus galaxy. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of... Well, and to give you the extent of the galaxy in something like a Hubble photo, you can see that the edge of the galaxy extend mm -hmm. almost to 110 here or over yeah. 110. Yeah. You really need a, a long exposure to pick up all of that from. Yeah. Um, but I love it. I mean, you can see the telescope. the swirling dust lanes. You can see those knots in the spiral arms, and then that just absolutely overexposed central core with just <laughs> so much stars down there. That's just Spe beautiful. Speaking of uh, M31, I came across in my research the other day that October 5th was the anniversary of Hubble's famous 
uh, variable photo of the oh, first Cepheid variable, where where he wrote on the image var with the exclamation point, mm -hmm. the the famous image that was actually the we just passed the anniversary of that. I don't know if you got any Cepheid variables in there. You might. Um, oh, and one last thing with the telescope, or sort of with the binoculars thing, is if you have a little more money to spend, I I do highly recommend the image stabilizing binoculars. I mean, they're those are cool. They're, they're amazing. Cool. Yeah, I've had a pair for about ten years, and I, I first got them to go to New Zealand because I was hiking and I wanted something to go to the southern hemisphere with, but I couldn't take a telescope with me. So it's the equivalent of a small telescope power wise. Yeah, but just getting that stability in the view is yeah. really terrific. I we uh, we were on the cruise uh, a year ago and somebody had brought uh, they brought well there was two of them on board and so one was the oh, was it the I think it was the fifties. They were like I've got fifteen 10 by fifty. Yeah, ten by ten okay. by thirty five. Ten by, and then the other I've one got though, fifteen was, x forty five. Excuse me. That's yeah, and then the other one was like twenty five by seventy five. I think. Yeah, they and make it was, more powerful ones. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were so big, so heavy. But you just you hold up to the sky and then you press this button and things all jiggling around. And you press this button and the whole thing just settles down yeah. and it's just perfectly still. I, yeah, yeah, I have to add a recommendation. I've had one of those for quite a few years, and, and what basically the reason they're nice for astronomy is they keep all the photons going into the right place on your retina. Yeah, instead of yeah. being jiggled around. Yeah, so right. so that's also if you're looking for a, you know a pair of binoculars, if someone's got the money, you cannot go wrong with those image stabilizers. The Canon ones are just terrific. I use I use those much more than the telescope actually, because it's just yeah. if you just want to pop out and look for something real quick, or if you're sweeping around looking for a comet, they're great. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move to Scott's uh, artistic view tonight. <laughs> yeah, so I... Uh, can you hear me still in the telescope? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a pina colada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I uh, just put it on... Uh, that's. Let's see, what was that? That was uh, the Pelican Nebula. Actually, it was the open cluster embedded in the Pelican Nebula. Let me see, what was the designation on that guy? Uh, that was NGC... NGC six, actually six nine nine six. Okay. I think that was it. Yeah. Yeah, because seven thousands in the North America Nebula, which is immediately adjacent to it. So, and they're numbered essentially in increasing right ascension across the sky. So if NG, if NGC seven thousands the North American, then yeah, this is, has to be within ten of seven thousands. So okay. Right. Yep. Yeah. So that was the uh, open cluster NGC six nine nine six. And I just flew the telescope to uh, a comet. I don't know if it's bright enough for the Mellencamp to pick it up yet or not. Let me see. It was uh, it was actually Comet Linear S1. Uh, let me pop off of uh, screen share there. Whoops, I think I hit the wrong button. Self-destruct. No, no, not <laughs> yeah, that one. Exactly. Don't press the dope button. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so that's the Mellencamp. I don't see it there yet, uh, but it might be because my pointing's a little bit off now that I've pulled the deck cable out, um, but it's, a, it's just a little comet, uh, C2010 S1 linear. According to my sky chart program, it should be around magnitude 15, which is only a little bit dimmer than uh, what ISON's been in the last few weeks, so I was curious to see if we could see that. I'll take a look for it and see if I can track it down. Uh, I don't see it. Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm going to move to Roy's view. Pac-Man! Yes, that Pardon? is... That is Pac-Man. It looks like a shark with like a really big chin. <laughs> it's like Jay Leno as a shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> what do you Live call it the Burbank. Leno Nebula? The Leno Nebula. Shark Nebula. Well, that, I was... No, don't, because Team Coco will go up there and, like, haze it, and it'll be bad. Like, what did they call... This is the thing I don't get. What did they call this nebula before 1970? 1980. 1980. 1980. What do they call it, right? Namco just had a patent pending and was waiting for something to go on. <laughs> like, so did it have a name? Did they did, like? What did they think this looked like before they thought it looked like Pac-Man? Is that F76? Yeah, I think so. They said it, it looked like NGC 281. It was the anthropomorphized <laughs> cheese wheel nebula. It looks and like the, an apple core. Uh, Ken Bruce. Uh, Ken Bruce just Googled image stabilized binoculars. The first one that showed had a price tag of four thousand nine hundred and eighty-nine. Uh, yeah, they're not they're not cheap. The, 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 no, the, but you're not you're gonna find them for cheaper than five thousand dollars. Yeah, the 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 fifteen x forty-fives. Of course, I bought those in nineteen ninety-eight. They're they're not new. The technology has been around a while. 
Um, they, yeah, they, but, were about, they were about 1200 bucks. Yeah, I think they're they're in the $400 range now, I think for you, the smaller I think, ones. I think the the 35 millimeters, I think there's a 10 next 35. I think they're about five 600. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, first. you know, they're pricey, but they're but they're not. No, they're, they're not $5,000. They're like the hydrogen alpha scopes. Like you can get the lower end PST for five hundred, or you can spend five thousand dollars for a upper end hydrogen alpha scope. Now look over on the left hand side of the Pac-Man Nebula, and you can see that it looks like there's like a, I don't know, like a little globule there. Like it looks a dark knot. Yeah, there's like a knot over on the left hand side of it almost, but it looks like it's being, but it looks more like it's like the material is kind of piling up, like it's. I can't sort of show, like, to the so, left of his eye. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I mean, that's star formation. That's, that's yeah. a classic kind of um, evap evaporating gas globule is what it's called. So, yeah, yeah any time that you see that, that kind of bunched up thing and it's, it's, there's a streak to it like that, that's, that's a knot and in the middle of there are stars forming. Chet1138 says, please do not call it the Sharknado Nebula. Mm. Too late. Too late. That's yeah, what you just did, Chad. That's what you just did, buddy. <laughs> this is the internet, sir. Like the you just... I, don't I, look I... at the elephant in the room. Don't yeah. look at the elephant yeah. in the room. Yeah. I, I looked up Comet S1 Linear, by the way, and it's about 12.4 12, 12 magnitude right now is what it's being reported at. So. It is a little a, fainter than Ison. Can I show a picture of a comet that's brighter than 12.4 yeah. magnitude? Let's do that. Let's Let's see bring the magical back. Not by much. One. I haven't done your no, galaxy by, yet, Bill, so bring it back. Not by too much. There you go. But... Okay, go ahead. While you're, are you, I'm going to go to Bill's view here while we, while we wait. Look at that. Man. That's M33. Wow. M33, yeah. Triangulum galaxy. So I mean, we've had our two nearest neighbor galaxies, uh, major spiral galaxies. There's plenty of dwarf galaxies in, uh, that are around in our, our local group, um, but M31 and M33 are the the other kind of big ones. M31 being huge. M33 is about one tenth the size of the Milky Way or the Andromeda yes. galaxy. But still, yeah, it just it, it fits so yeah. nicely in most of our, our deep sky field of view here. Is it moving towards us like Andromeda is? I'm not sure. It's. I don't think so. I think actually, if you you have and wait, I can't I can't see what I'm doing because I have my image of Ison up there. Um, <laughs> no, describe us what you're doing with your hands while you're talking about it. Well, imagine my two hands are moving toward each other very slowly, <laughs> and that after about three or four billion years, they'll smash into each other, and then somewhere out there is like a fly buzzing around. A, a kind of tangentially to the way my hands are moving. I think they're pretty sure that's the way that M33 is moving. It won't be involved in this collision between Andromeda and uh, the Milky Way, at least not any time in the next five billion years, right. uh, possibly longer, because its motion is kind of at a right angle to the way that um, the Milky Way and Andromeda are moving toward each other. That was a fantastic description yeah. of the visualization of the description you were doing. Well, the fact is that you broke the, you know, with three hands at some point, it Got a little weird, so. <laughs> um, oh, look at this! That is magical. It is. Thanks. This is it. This is my first ice in viewing. Okay. Uh, so this, yeah, I shot this yesterday morning. This would have been, yeah, Saturday morning. Um, it's a stack of 11 images from between about 5.30 and 5.55 a.m. Sky started to brighten about then. And um, this is no light pollution filter, because the, the thing is, the light pollution filter I have knocks out green, and this comet mm. is glowing mostly green, so I didn't want to... There's been talk about that. Yeah. yeah. About how ison has gone green. So I don't want to... I didn't want to wipe out the light it's from... It's watching its carbon emissions. Yeah. yeah. But this is, you know, the, I, when, when I'm shooting this, I'm, I'm looking through, like, all of the lights of Orange County. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You might as well just so, be staring into the sun. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no chance. I don't see any stars fainter than magnitude 2 in that direction of the sky. But, you know, what's nice is having a scope where once you get it aligned and it knows where it's pointing in the sky, you can punch in the right ascension and declination. And it, it almost dead-centered it for me there. Um, so, yeah, so this was a stack of 95-second exposures from yesterday morning. What I'm really even more impressed with is it got that little galaxy I can also see, yeah. in the field of view. Yeah. It's like, how the heck... Okay, you know, I, my, my wife's been um, 
wanting me to not have to, to drive out to places where she has no contact with me for hours when I when I have to go shoot a lot of times. And now if I can get stuff like that from the backyard, um, I think she'll she'll get her wish. And then I can like go sleep in my own bed. <laughs> has, yeah. it, has it got up. a secondary tail? I know. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it's not. I think it's, it's just kind of an artifact from, Is it? from processing okay. because it's not close enough to the sun yet to start generating an ion tail. Right. Um, so yeah, I think I think that just is kind of an artifact of the the uh, pixel array on my camera and um, a little bit of how I processed it there. But uh, mm. you know, the tail. I mean, the the field of view there is about maybe thirty to thirty five arc minutes, top to bottom. So it's got a good like five arc minute tail on it by now. That's mm. kind of cool. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I would love to see like maybe next week and see. Are, are you planning to do some more imaging this week? Um. Possibly. So, um, who knows? The, the scope is out there. If I feel, if I'm awake one morning and I feel like, you know, just going out for about two hours and seeing about capturing more of it, sure, we'll we'll see. Yeah, yeah, well, it would be great to see it, get an update. You know, yeah. in yeah, I'll come, weeks and see how. I'll come on over, Thad, and we can have a party of it. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, it's a morning <laughs> object, Scott. That's fine. All right. Just stay I up have not been able to... not, Yeah, I don't wake up early. I just stay up really late. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right. I, I have not been able to see Ison visually yet. I've scanned for it a few times, but it's probably going to be another week or two. Once it passes 10th magnitude, I'll probably have a shot at it. Oh, and and one of the things I've noticed is, you know, I, I downloaded the the ephemeris for it from the Minor Planet Center. I guess it must have been a couple of months ago. And the magnitude estimates that they were having for it now from a couple of months ago have it that it should be brightening to, to better than 10th magnitude, and it really hasn't yet. I noticed the, art, the initial article I wrote last year when they discovered it, uh, the light curve was showing October 1st for 10th magnitude, and we haven't reached it yet. No, and that's worrisome. Um, I mean, who? I mean, this is a comet. You never know. Maybe, yeah. maybe there's a bunch of evaporation that'll start. Yeah. To, Co comet oh. of the century, not listening. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. Yeah. So... Yeah. I, un unfortunately, I think less there's there's less and less. I'm again, I'm hopeful, but it, I'm getting the feeling there's less and less chance of that because yeah, it's crossed. Yeah. It's crossed the ice line. It's crossed yeah, the frost yeah. line, and if it were going to start doing anything, we'd, we'd see significant brightening since it's crossed the frost line. I guess. I'm not saying it won't happen, but yeah. it doesn't seem too likely at this point. I just, I just want to watch it just break don't up even, as it leaves. Don't the even sun. start. Really it is going to be super terrific. I really want a nice, you know, Fraser is going to be visual. so excited. He, he wants it yeah. to pee himself when he watches. I, it. One, That's how thing, it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that might give us some hope. I know the comet Lovejoy from a few years ago that had brightened up and uh, rounded the sun and became a great southern hemisphere comet. A lot of people have been pointing out it was fainter than Ison is now at the same distance. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's there's a little hope there. Yeah, it's just yeah. like when was the last time we saw a nice naked eye comet in the northern hemisphere? Like Comet Holmes, 2000. Holmes. That that was more of a yeah. A, it was a fuzzball. I mean, Hak yeah, yeah. Hakutake really, like was really the last yeah. one, and then yeah, off, I, right? Yeah. So we were. Well, 15 years ago? I mean, this is this is yeah. not right. Well, I, I caught McNaught in the, the Northern Hemisphere visually before... Um, it went south, yeah. Before it went... It, it did the absolutely phenomenal thing yeah, but, in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, but like a nice big comet with a nice streak that you just no, go outside the, and, you, and the, you look over and like, would, there's a comet. I would say that's, Hellbomb, we'll, yeah. We'll, that's, we'll yeah. Go order for the universe here. Okay, one comet. <laughs> one great. comet, please. So, in, yeah. in what was weird yeah. with Hayukutaki and hale Bop is they came, they came by like within six months. I mean, we yeah. were anticipating yeah. we were anticipating hale Bop. They found it in 95 and it came by in 97, but Hayukutaki came out of nowhere. And yeah. That was even, that was kind of cooler because it came up that was all pre-blogs, pre-everything. Yeah. So. yeah. Right. And that was like uh, fall of 96, if I remember right. Yeah. Or summer, yeah. I've, summer I've moved to Bill's photograph. The sand. Um, oh. And that is uh, 6946 is the galaxy, and 6939 is the cluster. Teo, te, teo mouse. I hope I got that right. What is that? The... the Flater mouse, deflator mouse, isn't that uh, bat? Mouse. German bat. Yes. Um, uh, every time the media says it will be the comet of the century, it jinxes it. So <laughs> that's exactly it. Every time people, but uh, yeah, as we mentioned, I think we mentioned in the weekly series hangout that that Ison on YouTube is just a gong show of conspiracy nonsense. But luckily, since 
it's being jinxed. It's just like a fairy, too, and if we clap, it'll come back to life, and we won't have to worry about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, All right, so what have you got, Bill? Uh, that is NGC 6946, which is the galaxy, and uh, NGC 6939 to the upper uh, left, which is a cluster. So what are we looking at? This, in, this wouldn't be Draco. This would be... Uh, I'm not sure where it's at. I'm just, I've moved on to the next object already, so... Now this is what Stellarium's for, right? So it was 6946, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So the fireworks galaxy, which I can kind of see that... Yeah. Pulling up another it's got a lot there. of red in it if you if you take a long exposure uh, image. Yeah. How long was your exposure on this one? Three minutes. That's just sick. That Stop is, talking, Bill. That that's yeah, you know, I, it's yeah. oddly enough, I've got a Canon uh, a D uh, uh, six D D sixty A the astronomy version, and then I've got the, the my regular camera that I use for mostly uh, most of my terrestrial photography is a is a five D Mark three. Frankly, I like the 5D Mark III better for astronomy than I did the one that's made for astronomy. Yeah, I'm really tempted to, yeah. to grab one of those. It's on the border between Cygnus and Cepheus. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're kind of looking just... Um, let me think. Maybe... But it's such a great face-on galaxy. Yeah, that yeah is it cool. really is. That's great. Uh, what have you got, Scott? I was I've sharing... got... Oh, which... Who? Ah, Scott Ferguson, Ferguson. Ferguson, the one with the telescope. Ferguson. <laughs> I've got the uh, the blue snowball NGC seven six six two. Oh, that's great! Looks like the number three. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's there's the numeral embedded in there. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like a little frog egg. An like, embryo. Like a little tadpole inside. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. It, yeah. it looks like a star about the mass of the sun that died within the past fifteen to. 50, I'm not seeing years. that. I'm yeah. not seeing that. <laughs> and yet it is. <laughs> um, Will Kalman says, I posted one of my unmodified DSLR photos last week in the Iris Nebula, so you don't really even have a modded camera. Just take your normal DSLR and start practicing. Amen. Yeah. So that's exactly right, which is, which is you know, get your T-adapter, bolt your, your DSLR, and... Put it into your telescope, and you've got a whole other world of, of options. Yeah. Um, cool. That's but that's great. So this is this is a planetary nebula, like what might happen to our sun in a few billion years. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, yep. Pretty much. It's the future. We'll be, Although, a nebula, we'll be a nebula for somebody else's virtual star party. That's right. <laughs> Although maybe not, right? I've heard recent research that we might not turn into a uh, planetary nebula. Well, yeah, I plan on I living think, long enough to find out. All right. Or being a <laughs> I think typically you need something with a little bit more mass than the sun has to get a white dwarf that dumps out enough UV light to really get it glowing. So, I mean, will there be a nebula left over after the sun dies? Yes. Will it be visible to somebody outside of our solar system? Po possibly not. In fact, even probably not, because as the, the sun is a one solar mass star, it just may not be a big enough or bright enough um, white dwarf left over when it's done to really power um, the, uh, you know, really, really get the gas glowing in what would be the planetary nebula that was our solar system. Yeah. I'm uh, moving to Gary's view. Speaking hey, we've Twitter, seen this. this. Is we have. This is the hydrogen alpha version of the um, like M27 dumbbell. And with with Gary's view, you can really see the how stretched out those sort of like the top and bottom is. Like normally, when you when you look yeah. like with your eyeball, you really see that dumbbell dumbbell shape, the one that's kind of going left to right. But in, with Gary's, it's way more elongated. Yeah, I'll see the fainter wings on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That extra little hydrogen that's been pushed out in, in that direction. And I think, I forget, was, it may have even been something, that, David, that you wrote and talking about how if you saw the, the dumbbell no, it from the other if it was yeah. oriented, so we were looking kind of along that direction it, where the, it, the dumbbell is that it would look it sounds like a ring. Yeah, it sounds like something I'd researched. It's like you're looking at this just like perpendicular, like if right. you think of it as a tube, whereas right. right. M57, you're looking at it like face, the tube, like down the tube face on. Right, so oh, M oh. M M57, and then... You just see them at different orientations. Oh, hold on. Yeah. People can't see your hands. Okay, here. Dad, do yeah. that again. Yeah. Right. So there's so there's M57. Yeah. Right. 
and then you're seeing M twenty six. And then and then uh, <laughs> and yeah, the dumbbell on it's is kind of rotated and maybe ninety degrees from that. I always tell people M fifty seven looks like the ghost of a donut when they're looking through the eyes <laughs> at it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Donut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, BTL seven forty three Fraser, what's the deal with astronomy cast? Does it still happen? I'm out of the loop. Uh, we recorded last Monday. Uh, we did one on uh, particle accelerators, and we're recording tomorrow. We've got it. You've got an event. We're going to be doing uh, observational versus experimental astronomy. So, yep, we're just in our fall schedule now that Pamela's back from her travels. So, yep, yeah, and and my kind of summer holiday is over. So, <clears throat> tons of astronomy cast every week, all you can handle. I'm moving back to Bill's view. Oh, I'm seeing his. There we go. Uh, Cocoon Nebula. Yeah. Oh, yeah. look at that. And so, I mean, you can see here we have dark nebula, and it's, it's really obvious on the, the um, kind of background of, of fainter stars in the background that you have this... Whoops, where'd it go? Oops, um, <laughs> bring it back! Program malfunction, I'll get it back in just a second okay. here. But, I mean, you, you can see there's this dense field of stars around it, and then where the dark nebula is, it, it definitely kind of trails out where you have this kind of denser, cooler material blocking... The, the view behind it. So you have an emission nebula where the red is, it's hydrogen, there's actually a little bit of reflection nebula around there too, providing a little bit of blue, and then this this trailing dark nebula. And so, I mean, this looks to me, you know, rather different than what we saw with the veil, where it's just half of the picture was covered, and, the, you know, typically dark nebulae a good bit more, a good bit denser than um, what we were seeing on the other side there with the veil. So I'm really thinking that may have just been kind of chance alignment with, with dense part of Milky Way versus not as dense part mm, of Milky Way. Not like it's some kind of comet plowing, leaving some kind of trail in front <laughs> right. of the... Yeah. Uh, so there's a really interesting conversation going on in the comments over on YouTube. And I've got to say, like, if you're not participating in the comments on YouTube, that's kind of where the conversation is going on. Sure. I hate to say it, YouTube comments are often unsavory, uh, but uh, the YouTube <laughs> comments are here are wonderful. So, um, But there's a great conversation. People are talking about Gary Ganella's um, tracking uh, or tracking mount that you put that you put a DSLR on the top of. You got this, was it from Orion, Gary, that you got? Remember, you did some wide um, field stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 that was the Orion that's designed to take the DLSR. Yeah, so it's, so it's just a mount designed, it's like it tracks the the sky, and so you can you can put the your DSLR on it, and then you get a tracking view. There you go. You took this picture with that? No, that's not you. No, that's uh, Bill. Bill's moved to another picture, so I'm gonna move over to Gary's view here. Uh, this is the Heart Nebula, at least a major piece of it. Uh, there's some stuff up at the top here, and I'm trying to find the knot that um, that we were looking at earlier. Uh, but this is the majority of the Heart Nebula. That's great. And th there's that same kind of knot structure yeah. Yeah, up at the top there. Yeah, take another little piece of my heart now, baby. <laughs> no, so. Turn it up to gain. Let's hear it. <laughs> Wait, is there, isn't there a copyright thing if I sing it? Uh, yeah, too are you many kidding? Bars or too I'm, already, I'm already getting uh, takedown yeah. violations right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's what we're talking about. That's the, that's the piece of technology that Gary has. I don't know if you have it kicking around, Gary. Uh, the picture or the mount? The mount. Uh, I think they just reviewed that just... in the telescope recently too. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, I think Pamela grabbed one too. So. Yeah, just a Ryan telescope, and it's mm -hmm. their mount, and it, the price is pretty good. Yeah, that's like a what, 150 bucks or something. Yeah, something like that. That's not bad. Yeah, and just clamp your DSLR and then take these beautiful wide view shots of the Milky Way. Yeah, you just do a real quick polar alignment and uh, go for it. Perfect. That's cool. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move back to Scott Ferguson's view. Oh, I'm still I'm still getting my view ready here. I'm Are you okay? Well, then I'm gonna move yep. to Bill's view. Yep. Okay, wow. uh, I see 1396. I I see it too. I see. I do. Yeah. I, I'm <laughs> there. Um, kind of the you can see the arc of the nebula here. It's actually almost like the rosette in terms of its uh, you know it's kind so of circular. So purple. I love yeah. the color um, coming out oh, here. But, and and I think the color is actually more red than purple. But what's that star over on the left hand side? It's in. You know, it's, ne sure. it's never never land actually. <laughs> and, and up at the top here is that a structure inside of it called the elephant's trunk. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, you just gave me context. <laughs> That's awesome. Another new thing that I've learned. 
your images tonight, Bill, are just yeah. fantastic. Yeah, this I is decided something. to put that camera on there. It's just it's got a much wider, it's, well, it's got a significantly wider field than the 60DA because it's a full frame chip. It's it's really pretty sensitive, although maybe a little lacking in the red. And it's just it's a really good star party camera. Yeah. yeah. So so if you ever think you want to do anything different, don't. <laughs> this is it. I, I hate to say this, but you are you are locked into this view because it is just terrific. Wow. Amazing. All right. Uh, Gary's going to show us some clouds. Yep. That is the Triffid Nebula with some uh, wispy high clouds. From Earth. That's actually yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. That looks beautiful. Yeah. I thought it came out well, so I thought I'd put it up there. Clouds within six miles and then clouds within 6,000 light years. <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah. good ratio. Yeah. About yeah. the same. Actually, they're yeah. probably cirrus clouds, so maybe 10 to 12 miles instead, but still, yeah. Yeah, they're high. They're yeah. the high, wispy stuff. Uh, again, there's an additional conversation going, talking about, uh, in, sorry, in the YouTube comments about uh, DSLR versus, uh, sorry, Canon versus Nikon and sort of how a lot of the astrophotography... Well, and now it goes yeah. downhill because... Yeah, I know. Here comes the fight. So please, <laughs> well, keep, keep it I, I can only comment to say that I, I sold my Nikon and stuff and bought a Canon and, and because of the lenses, not because of the cameras themselves. Hmm. Well, I know Canon also came out with a model, the 60DA, which is particularly for astrophotography, that it doesn't have an IR filter installed in it. And that's, that's typically a modification that you have to make to a DSLR to make it more sensitive to the type of light that you, you want to pick up if you're shooting deep sky objects. Um, Canon already did it with this particular model, um, that there's just no IR filter in it so that it is better suited for, for deep sky objects. They're, they're, they've re-released that 60DA too. Uh, or, originally they just did an initial run of them a few years ago and then everybody uh, gobbled them up pretty much. So hmm. uh, they decided they brought it back though about a year ago. They're, they're producing it now again. Oh great. Have you had a chance to play with one? No, I'd like to. I'd like to be able to get a hold of one though for my second DSLR eventually. I have an Icon D60 yeah. right now, but yeah, we should talk to Ken and get one into your hands at some point. Okay, <laughs> that'd be cool. Okay, um, uh, yeah. So this is this is a photograph that you took another time. This is the one of the, with the mount, right, Gary? Yes, yes. This is uh, around the. Um, let me get the picture up. Holy cow! Around that's the American a huge field of view. The American yeah. Nebula. Yeah, this is like a 30 millimeter lens on a Canon 20DA. I mean, just just to give some feel for this, I mean, the North American Nebula, which is kind of just above um, and center of that that uh, the the bright star in the center of that is Deneb, and then just above that, the North American Nebula would take up six full moons from one end to the other in the sky. And so what this field of view is, I mean, this is this is an enormous, like a 40-degree chunk of sky from one side to the other. You have Seder, which is Gamma Cygni, a little bit down and to the left from, from Deneb. You have the Butterfly Nebula and, and the, the, the hydrogen clouds around Gamma Cygni. Um, we're going back into Cepheus in the upper right. And, yeah, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. Just yeah, how much sky is in there. I'd say I think it was a 30 millimeter lens. Uh, I did have a um, sky glow filter, and um, my normal my telescope gets an area when I look at the North American Nebula, I get about this much of it right here. Now, is this your? This isn't from your backyard, is it? Yeah, wow. uh, this this is the backyard with a with a huh. pollution filter. Really? Wow. Yeah. So I mean, if you went to, if you took that out to some dark skies, it would probably be even more phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, terrific. And so the, the trick, though, is because you've got that tracking mount on the scope, on the mount, then you can leave it open and do this big, long exposure. And that's yeah, when, now that's, that the Canon cameras by themselves will go a 30-second exposure. Now, I built up a little board that's just battery-powered that I put on it, and this is about a two-minute exposure. Yeah, so the uh, people are ooing and aahing. Um, yeah, okay, we no, should start no to, airplanes either. Yeah. So I want to. We're gonna wrap this up. We got one more image, I think, from from Bill. And I don't know, Scott, if you've got. I see something in your view. I'm not sure what that is. Um, and uh, but I want to remind people that if you've got pictures that you've taken of the night sky, you can feed them into the event. Yeah. Uh, and post your own pictures. I can see a few people doing that, but just like if you've got some pictures that you've taken that you're really proud of, 
go ahead and put them in, and what I will do, or Scott will do, is we'll pick one of those images and use that as the header for the next week's Virtual Star Party. So each week, I think, uh, you know, we'll try and show off some of your beautiful pictures. And, and make sure they're yours. If they're not yours, I will remove them. Yeah, yeah, don't, um, don't, yeah, they have to be pictures that you've taken, yeah. so. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to move to Bill's view. <laughs> oh, my God. So yeah, it's, uh, just uh, the obligatory M31 picture. Yeah, um, you know, just because why not? Yeah, you, you have to have one. I mean, it's just so bright and it makes such an impressive object. Uh, it's it's uh, worth doing. This gives much more of an idea of the span of it on the sky. This this is showing it. Yeah, you've got a really wide small. field of view. Yeah. Yeah, it's thanks to the full frame chip on the camera. And we're even getting some of the star clusters in the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, we, we've had some views of star clusters within our galaxy earlier in the VSP. You can even see some of these little knots of, of brighter patches within Andromeda. Those are star clusters in another galaxy um, visible in this image. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Okay. I can move on. Uh, and Scott, you've got another uh, another cluster for us. Yes, another globular cluster. Uh, globular. This one. <laughs> globular. Globular. You know, I think I'm going to like you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> this one is uh, M15, Messier 15, uh, all, also known as NGC 7078, uh, and it's uh, 34,000 light years away. This is a nice one to find, too, because, I mean, it's in Pegasus. It's right near the bright star Enif. Your E N I F is the the name of the star, and so you you kind of have this one kind of edge of the constellation makes kind of a check mark, and you just follow that check mark up through a NIF, and M15 is is something that um, it's kind of pointed at by that that line of stars in Pegasus, and so if if you're trying to hunt globular or globular clusters uh, for the the first time, trying to find some of your first deep sky objects, this is this is good a good one that's well placed to get to just from star hopping rather than if you need a mount that tracks or something. Right. This, is, this is a pretty easy find. All right. So Gary's got one more picture here that we'll show. Oh, the propeller. Propeller, yep. yeah. The obligatory propeller. Thought I'd bring yeah. it up. That's, That's good. Your clouds yeah, cleared cool. up. It seems like it's even a little clearer now. Yeah, that part of the sky. It depends on where I'm shooting. I'm shooting a little uh, higher for this one. Mm. Yeah, it yeah, looks great. Yeah. The Trifid would be down toward my direction. And I know we often get kind of clouds rolling in off the Pacific down here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's great. Yeah, galaxy, that's wonderful. I'm I'm more toward the center of the galaxy than Gary is. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> really? You're closer to the maybe to the because of your the big fat head and all the the mass and gravity <laughs> being towards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Bill gets one last picture, and he's bringing us an uh, an airplane or a satellite. Yep. And and, a, and something, either. some kind of thing. There. You're turning to the heart this time in color. Oh, oh right nice. on. Okay. Do you have a way to rotate this one? Can yeah, you rotate uh, it down? Uh, what, clockwise? One? Yeah, rotate it, rotate it twice clockwise. So, flip it. Well, you don't want to, like, flip it. Is that what you're after? Yeah. yeah. Looks like we've got ventricles yeah. and atria. And, yeah. yeah. Too bad we don't have Dr. Uh, Stuart Foreman here. Yeah, that's right. Us, uh, <laughs> get to the bottom of this. Last week, he, he was able to provide cool. a... This is the mitral cluster in here. <laughs> <laughs> and you see it's prolapsed there, so we do need to go in and replace the valve so we can have the aortic <laughs> dispenser. Or, or at least some antibiotics if you have any. <laughs> that's oh, great. That's fantastic. Oh, just terrific. Okay, cool. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up then. I, we're like we've hit our hour, yeah. and uh, I, this I think we could just keep showing these images off all night, but I think we'd better. Better wrap it up. So, um, thank you once again to uh, <laughs> to the Games Major. To, uh, to thank you very much to uh, to Bill and Scott and Gary. That was just terrific. Roy uh, dropped from his uh, mediocre cell phone connection. So, um, and uh, and David and Scott and yeah. Thad. Thank you very much for bringing the knowledge. Um, what's happening this week in your world, Scott? You got another Space Fan news happening? Yes, yeah, Space Fan News is will be coming up Friday. We're going to do it on Thursday since I have a conference this weekend. But that's the major thing. And then in two weeks' time, there's a, another Science on Google Plus hangout that I'll be hosting. Okay, great. On ecology and environmental sciences. That has nothing to do with space. 
Uh, yeah, it does. We're doing one on climate change, which has everything to do everything with true. planets. And atmospheric, yeah. There we go. Yeah, did you, oh man, the new report from the, for, on climate change is pretty nasty. Anyway, um, I'm not going to bum everyone out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the government shut down. Let's cheer yeah. everyone up. By yeah, it's been world. rough. I got to uh, say, I, the last week without having NASA, access to anything in NASA mm. has been, you don't realize how many times you try to look I, for stuff on NASA sites and there's just nothing. I, I go to a site daily and, and, oh yeah, that is NASA, darn. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like I'm the, trying to re all my resources, like half of them are gone now. And you're having to find other ways to get to that yeah. And they've now they've shut down radio telescopes, and now they're shutting down NOA stuff. This is and some interns. Uh, some interns are stranded because they shut down the dorms in which interns were living in. <laughs> yeah, so, well, yeah, that. yeah. I heard about that too. Yeah, this Maybe. is this is bad. So I I hope uh, you know as a, your neighbor to the north, I really hope you guys get this figured out. But I signed up for Obamacare, so hey, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, yeah. So government shut down. But we'll keep bringing the uh, the space, and so space, we've got astronomy cast. Be there for Somebody you, so. has to. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've got astronomy cast tomorrow at noon Pacific, um, and then we'll be doing the weekly space hangout on Friday at uh, at noon as well. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone for watching, and thanks for all the astronomers that brought their telescopes. Thank yes, you very thank much you. to all of the knowledge that was brought. It was great to see you all, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Good night, everyone. Bye, guys. Good night. Good night. See ya.